I want to look, as I've mentioned already, I want to look just at the theme of singing for a little while this evening, singing praise at the beginning of Psalm 96. We have sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day uh, after day. And I think singing uh, for us is a greater or maybe a lesser important part of our lives. It's maybe more important for some people than for others. But I think probably in our tradition and in our uh, thinking, it's maybe a little bit of the Cinderella part of worship in the sense that it's regarded as something you just get through till you get to the sermon. You've got to go through a couple of singings and then, then you come to the real thing, which is the word. But of course, uh, when we're singing, we're singing the word or we're singing the truth of the word. And uh, it's a hugely significant and important part of worship to know and to remember that uh, as it is commanded to us here in this great significant book of the Bible uh, is the Bible, the book of praise and the book of uh, prayers and song. And uh, there's a wonderful verse. Uh, uh, if you, if uh, you wonder about the, uh, the genesis of song and the importance and the significance spiritually of song uh, from God and uh, uh, in God's mind, then we have a great, wonderful verse in Zephaniah uh, chapter 3. Tremendous words, where the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. And I think we find it hard to conceive of God singing uh, because somehow... Uh, well, I'm not quite sure why we find that difficult. Maybe because we recognize him as spirit. Um, but we have this great recognition that we are made in God's image. And uh, he has made us to be people who uh, will use this wonderfully created gift that he has given us for him. Because it reflects him and it's like him. And it is an expression for us of our praise to him. So I want to look at just four things very briefly this evening about singing uh, biblically that's uh, something that's important to us because, uh, you know, as I said, I think I mentioned in the prayer that we come together week after week and every week we sing. We pray and uh, we read the word, but the singing, particularly for us uh, in the church here, is something that we are a a actually practically involved in and a little bit more as it were uh, although you know I'm always banging on about being active even as you listen and that's very important uh, but we are we're really involved at that level in the singing and so I think it's important for us not to do uh, not to participate in that important section of our worship thoughtlessly and um, carelessly Remember what a significant part of worship it is. I think in the first place we recognize it as uh, the language very much uh, of the heart. Psalm 30 verse 12 says, You turned my mourning into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. Now, the heart singing may not necessarily be the voice singing always, but I think the voice is often the expression of the heart. I think it's possible for us to sing in our hearts. But I think normally that the praise that he's given us is to be expressed from our heart, but verbally uh, and uh, with sound through uh, our voices. Ephesians 5:19, Sing and make music in your heart. The two are linked together. Sing. And make music in your heart, always giving thanks to God. So it's very much, in, in many ways, uh, as we uh, consider it, it's the language of the heart. Uh, it expresses our emotion and our sense of worship at that level. And, you know, that happens in life, doesn't it? How often do we know and see and appreciate, maybe particularly today more than ever, uh, the power of song? as it expresses the emotions of people's lives and hearts, both love and hate and sorrow and joy. How significant, how important today are songwriters. Um, in many ways, they often are dictating 
what many people are thinking about things because they express the language of the heart. And often political movements and, and uh, philosophical movements are expressed in song because they are significant at that level. And spiritually, that is no different. There's that recognition that uh, God has given us song as a way of expressing the inexpressible. And therefore, it has great significance because we are to use song to express our faith and to express our worship to the living God and the feelings of our heart. It is therefore a deeply personal thing as we participate in it together. It is a personal uh, reflection of our living faith in Jesus Christ. And as such... uh, are hugely significant. And the songs of David, the Psalms of David, are those kind of expressions, not just of joy. Now, we're maybe focusing more this evening on praise and joy, but the Psalms express in ways that no hymns or other kind of songs will do, express great sorrow, uh, amazing doubt, uh, tremendous fear, anger, uh, testimony. There's all kinds of emotion and uh, expressions of the heart uh, given in song i can't remember now what the uh, what the event was something very sad happened in the congregation either someone had died or we had heard some bad news and we just happened uh, to be singing a, a hugely uh, sad song sad psalm and it was one that that you know you would sometimes look at and say well how can you sing that in public worship and it's very uh, mournful and and very contemplative at that level but I remember many people some of you may remember this and might remember both the psalm and the occasion which I can't but many people found that the most outstanding expression Uh, and that's why we can sing for example at funerals and why, why singing at funerals can be so powerful as they express grief and as they express sorrow uh, and also joy. I remember also, and this is slightly changing the subject, well, not changing the subject, but changing the emphasis, uh, being at a funeral in, in the previous congregation, it was in Roskine, but it was in the Church of Scotland in Invergordon, and it was a young person who had died uh, in a car accident. And the church was packed. Hundreds and hundreds of people were there mainly young people, mainly people from school, from high school. And it was a traditional service, and they sang hymns, and it was very uh, controlled. And, uh, you know, the people sung the hymns, and uh, the older people especially knew these hymns. Most of the young people didn't know them. And it was all very controlled. But at the end of the service, as the remains were being taken, uh, there was a song came over the... Uh, loudspeakers uh, a a popular song from the day I'm not sure uh, You Raise Me Up or one of these songs and at that point all the young people just broke into tears because that for them was their expression they knew that that song expressed what they felt it wasn't spiritual it wasn't I'm not saying it was right and, and it was a reflection of the society in which we live that that was much more powerful to them than the hymns were or the psalms would have been because they, d- they didn't know them really but this song that they sung expressed how they felt and it was the uh, the way that uh, they, they then went on to show uh, emotion and we look for that in our spiritual lives that the songs we sing express for us spiritually uh, the language of our hearts. And uh, we recognize that. This great psalm here expresses the nature and the character of God and his salvation and his judgment. And it looks forward to uh, a new creation and this amazing reality of song, uh, even through and in creation, uh, that uh, we can look forward to uh, after and following his judgment. And so it's a marvelous expression of the language of the heart. Therefore, for us, we need to ask the question as we worship tonight, when we sing, how real is it for us? How much have we thought through that we are singing and expressing the language of our hearts and the faith that we have? It ought to be something that reflects for us the reality of our Christian experience and the understanding of what we're doing. 
I would imagine, because I know my own heart and I know my own experience, that I will go through many services, and I've chosen the, the Psalms and the hymns thoughtlessly. And I'll come away and I'll not think and I'll not consider what I've, I've sung. And uh, that is a shame. That's a shame to Jesus' name, and it's a shame in our worship that we can, at a human level, sing in an easy and in a lazy and in a passive way where we're simply going through the motions and we're not using the words of Scripture or the words of truth to say, I am here, and I'm here to praise, and I'm here to worship God, and He's given me song to do so, and this is a reflection of my heart. And so often I think that we, we, we regard this song uh, at an entertainment level, how it's, uh, we've enjoyed the music or we've enjoyed the tune or we've enjoyed the, the harmony. And all of these things are significant and important, but none of them should take from us the significance of expressing our heart worship uh, to the living God and the activity of doing so. So in many ways, each of us are being asked to make music in our hearts when we worship, when we come together, and to reflect that in song. And if we are uh, serious about that, then it, even the songs that we sing in our worship it challenge us about our faith and challenge us about our living relationship with Christ and challenge us if we can sing these words and if they do mean anything to them and if they are an expression of our own hearts and of our own praise. And therefore, there should be, a, in, many, in many ways, each time we sing, there should be self-reflection and there should be self-examination as we consider the Christ to whom we're singing and the gift that he's given and the obedience we've been asked uh, to sing with. I wonder if possibly uh, the singing is a thermometer um, as to our spiritual condition sometimes. And I'm not saying that's necessarily the case, but I do wonder. And it's often the way, and, and preachers maybe are sometimes more aware of that, that very often... The sense of God's spirit when you come into the worship, public worship together, will be reflected in the, the way the singing is going. Now, now that's maybe not a, a, always the case, but very often there's that sense uh, of uh, living, vibrant worship through the song as, as we start the service, and it kind of sets the tone very much for the whole service. Not indisputably, of course, but uh, maybe from week to week there's that sense in which, well, I think everyone's just got out of bed today and hasn't thought of anything and have come tired and weary and uh, are really going through the motions. And then, we, and then as a preacher, you look at yourself and you say, well, maybe that's exactly what I've done as well. We're going through the motions uh, of worship and praise. And we must never allow the reality of the ritual of worship, which is a good ritual, to become simply a ritual. And it must be an, an ongoing week-to-week -week expression of our faith and praise. So there is the question for us about preparation and the importance of preparation, not just for singing, but for worship generally together as, as we consider that, that we do, it's required of us, I think, spiritually, that we will uh, receive more from the word and from the worship uh, and we will give more as our hearts are prepared and as we have uh, considered uh, our own expressions of praise uh, and coming together. Our response, our needs, our feelings, um, it's so significant that we come to worship in the house of God with a sense of being prepared, of doing business with the living God and of coming together to worship him. And that's really... In many ways, what I think will uh, enable the worship here to be a powerful experience. When each of us have come, recognizing our responsibility, recognizing our privileges, recognizing our debt to Jesus, and the, the, the honor of coming together uh, and worshiping him. So there's clearly a sense in which it's the language of the heart. But and, and these are all kind of overlapping and intertwined. It's, always the, it's also the language of the crowd. 
And very much uh, we find that in Scripture. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the Lord. Let us come before him with praise and thanksgiving. And Psalm 1, 2, 6, where we all, all come up to the house of God and praise him and give thanks to him. These Psalms of Ascent that we've seen before. Uh, and again, I think it's a very significant and important part of the community of believers coming together in worship. And again, we see it reflected in life. You see, you see it at sports events, the singing that reflects the crowd response and reaction and worship. Uh, we see it at concerts, people coming together uh, for great concerts and this amazing experience of singing in crowds together and what a buzz and what an excitement and what an amazing thing it is and so spiritually singing is very much the language of the people the language of the community the language of the crowd the language of the kingdom language of the people together as the people came up to the temple they came and worship and they came and worship together and the new testament church As it looked forward, looked forward to that amazing day in Revelation 19.6, which speaks about, I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roaring of our rushing waters, like the loud peals of thunder, as the crowd of believers in the city of God came together to worship and praise him. And so there's that great sense of society and worship, of not simply individualism and personal preparation, but of people coming together. And that, that is a, a really important part of corporate worship. When we come together and sing, it's that, that actual uh, outworking of being a people. We sing together. You know, it would be strange if we came together. Let, let's sing. And everyone started singing different songs at different paces and different times and facing different ways. It would be a cacophony of just strange sound, wouldn't it? There's a unity in the fact that we come together and we sing the songs of God together because song is an expression of our unity in Christ. Have you ever sung in a crowd, whether it's a Christian crowd or it's a crowd and a, a, a sports event or a concert? You will sense unity with that crowd. Hey, we're all in this together. We're all here to listen. We're all here to watch. We're all here to sing. And so in worship, there's that sense in which song is an expression of unity in Christ, that we are coming together to worship what, what he is, who he is, and what he's done. And we have much more reason to sing heartily. I don't really care if people can't sing musically. I don't care if you haven't a note in your heads musically. It's about singing from our heart and our soul and that a reflection of a sense of unity and oneness that we have in Christ. That is what we have. We are one in Christ. And along with that uh, sense of uh, unity is, is the encouragement that comes from that. Great encouragement. You'll all have been in congregations where the sense of worship through the singing has been dreadful, awful. Singing's been dire and is discouraging. Nobody's singing. Sometimes you go to some churches and, and hardly anybody's. And in, in, a, in, a, in the minister's position, you're in a kind of privileged position. You're facing everyone. You can see everyone. And now that can be encouragement. It could also be greatly discouraging. Uh, and I'm sure maybe as the congregation looks at the minister, it can sometimes be hugely discouraging to do so. Uh, but that we, you know, think, sometimes we do need to think about how we sing, our expressions, uh, whether we're encouraging others around us by uh, the unity and the heartiness and the wholeheartedness of our praise and worship as we express and share together. Great encouragement in that. So we can, you know, do we not all need encouragement? Do we not all need to be built up? And song is one of the ways in which we are encouraged and built up. And there is a reality that uh, as we sing together and as we sing powerfully together uh, that uh, we... uh, Simply open up heaven. Because the gathering of God's people is a foretaste of heaven. It's meant to be a foretaste of heaven. And that includes the singing, you know. It includes uh, our praise. And uh, that's hugely significant uh, for people that come in. 
that they taste that the Spirit of God is here. And they know that when we sing, we're worshipping uh, a living Savior, an important uh, person uh, in our lives. And uh, therefore, uh, we look uh, to encourage one another in that way with our singing. And it should be, I think, for us, spine-tingling in many instances when we gather together. So when we, uh, we never want the situation to be that the ones at the front here are performing for you. Just as we never want the minister to be here to perform. He's here to bring the word and humbly be under the word. So the leaders at the front are to be those who, uh, the, the congregation is to be the choir. The congregation is to be the ones who sing. We never want to get to the place where our professionalism and we seek to be the very best we can be, and that's important and biblical, but that it never replaces the reality and the power of the people coming together in song. We don't want to be entertained. We don't want a performance at the front. We want those at the front offering their gifts and their abilities to lead the congregation in worship and in praise. And that's a hugely significant role. And you sh- we should be praying for them uh, just as much as we pray for all who are involved in serving and uh, part of the worship in the church. So it's the language of the crowd. It's also the language of worship itself. And we recognize, come, let us sing, let us worship before him and extol him, praise him with music and song. Uh, it is... Uh, the way God has given us expression and devotion and adoration and in worthy praise. He is, in other words, he's worthy of our song. He's worthy of our praise. And it's a place where we offer to him our worship and we learn about his character, his word, his prophecy, his history, his testimony. And it is given to us in order to do that. So it should, I believe, reflect uh, in our lives a sense of reverence and worship. In Psalm uh, 65, in verse 8, we have this translation, the whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. So there's a, a, a link between the awe and reverence and the songs of joy it doesn't you know, mean we sing mournfully. Uh, to be reverential and to be uh, awestruck is not to not sing with joy. But it is to be awestruck at who uh, God is in his character. And that is it's hugely... We can't manufacture that. I think all we can do is pray for that. Because we can't manufacture awe, but it should be that in our lives and in our song and in our praise, there is a, a weighty reverence. So we don't sing flippantly. However joyfully we sing, I'm not saying don't sing joyfully, but I'm saying don't sing flippantly. Don't sing lightly. Don't sing rebelliously so that we come to church on a Sunday and sing praise to God heartily and just give it yee And then for the rest of the week, we're simply living as lords of our own life. And we're not giving him that rightful place of awe and worship and obedience because that's hypocrisy. And that can't be for us in our Christian life. So we can see that praise and singing is... Uh, intimately related to our own Christianity and our own Christian faith. And it can be that we are quenching the Spirit if we are not adoring Him through our song as a reflection of the living sacrifice of our lives. So, in a sense, what you've done from last Monday to today will probably color and mold the praise that you've offered tonight. Uh, Not in the sense of we come to a place to uh, earn the favor of God, but as a reflection of the lives we live that we come to him at the beginning of a new week in praise and in adoration. 
So there's a great sense in which it is the language of worship at that level. And I think it's also the language of worship in the, the sense of it being uh, revelatory, is that songs teach us Scripture, teach us truth. One of the great things about singing the Psalms, isn't it, that we learn truth. We learn Scripture. And the hymns, we learn the great salvation truths and the great truths about Jesus Christ and the gospel message. And let the songs of our worship educate your soul. You know, I I can go to my kids or any kids around uh, and they will be able to repeat hundreds and hundreds of lyrics of songs. Hundreds of lyrics of songs. And I'll hear a song on the radio too, because that's what you listen to when you're over 50, radio too, and I'll be able to hear a song that I haven't heard for 35 years, and I'll know all the lyrics of the song, every single verse. Because song is a hugely significant teaching, revelatory way of remembering things. And we had folks in today for lunch, and uh, they were talking about their strict upbringing, how they were taught all the Psalms, and indeed the whole of Jonah, and other books in the Bible, uh, even when they weren't believers, and having come to faith, that these come back to them and educate them and teach them about their God. And so we know and we appreciate and we recognize the power of song uh, as revelation and as teaching us and reminding us and renewing truth in our minds. And so it has a hugely significant uh, place to play in worship at that level. Please don't think of singing as uh, just uh, leading up to the sermon. It is a significant and important and uh, central part of our worship. And the last thing I would just say about singing is that it is, I believe, clearly from Scripture, the language of heaven. It's the language of heaven. Even in Psalm 5, in verse 11, we're told, uh, but let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. That will be one thing that will be continuous between this world and the world to come, but much better. It will be praise, adoration, and song. These amazing revelatory passages in the last book of the Bible, uh, awe-inspiring fellowship, people of God together, great numbers, heart expression on a cosmic scale, uh, so many that it just can't be counted. And there, can you imagine the buzz of singing with that kind of crowd? Presumably all in tune. <laughs> Presumably all with perfected voices and glorious harmonies with a clear vision of who Jesus Christ is and praising before him and uh, glorifying him at that great uh, supper of the Lamb. And not only will they be praising, but I think this Psalm 96 hints that all creation will be praising. The, the trees of the forest will sing for joy. The fields will be jubilant and everything in them because the curse will have gone. The fields will be singing because there will be no more weeds to choke the growth and no more rocks to stop things being fruitful. And it will be tremendous. This whole universe will, in the new heavens and the new earth, be able to sing praise to God. And I think that it will take on a, a, a depth and a level that we simply can't uh, really appreciate here. So when we sing, as I said earlier, it's anticipatory because it's also the language of heaven. It is a reflection of the King of Kings that we will go to live with. And our life, as we sing, it's preparing us for heaven. And that is an important and significant reality for us, that when we come to worship, we come to praise, and I say, let's stand and sing a song. And you stand up, think another five or six verses. Remind yourself it's not the end of the story, that this is to point us forward to something far better that it is anticipatory for us at that level. And so singing in worship should inspire hope for us. It should inspire hope that the bleak and the miserable and the frustrating world in which we live 
with so much bad news, with so much bitterness, with so many difficulties and problems and trials and, diff- and struggles is not all that there is. And so when we come to sing, it inspires hope within us so that even in our darkest moments, there should be songs we can sing. And song isn't just about praise and adoration in the good times and in times of joy. In many ways, there's nothing more powerful than song through tears and song through bitterness and darkness as we express our feelings before God. So may it be that um, when we gather together in our worship, in our lives generally, but when we gather together in our worship, that we do consider song as of spiritual significance and uh, in many ways a thermometer for us and uh, a hope to inspire us forward and to keep us going. May it be encouraging for us, may it be uplifting, may it be uniting and uh, may it be Christ-centered and Christ-reflecting. So let us uh, pray and then sing. Father God, we ask and pray that you would remind us that um, uh, we don't sing uh, because it's traditional. And we don't sing because, well, that's just what you do when you come together. We sing because you've ordained praise. We sing because you have commanded us to praise you. We sing because you've given us voices to praise Uh, and because we have every reason to praise. And we are amazed that uh, God looks over us with uh, songs of joy. And uh, we are amazed at the creativity and beauty and splendor and um, glorious reality of of a God who has given us uh, this expression and uh, given us all the beauty that goes with it. We ask that we wouldn't use song as is so often used in this world in which we live to be destructive or brutal or atheistic or using song in a way that is idolatrous but that we would recognize and know the pure beauty and glory of the songs that you've given us and of the voices that we are to use for your glory. We thank you even in the city when we can wake up sometimes and hear the birds singing and how amazing that is in its complexity and yet in its simplicity. And we ask that as we praise, we may reflect the Savior uh, in whose name we sing. The psalmist speaks of singing a new song and indeed we have a new song to sing every day because of what Jesus has done because he is coming to judge the world in righteousness, because he has come as Savior and Lord, and because the cross and the resurrection and the ascension have given us such great reasons for praise. So as we close our worship this evening, may we praise you. May we praise you with adoration and with meaning. And may even in this moment it reflect our hearts as we seek to be Uh, close to you through forgiveness and grace and through the work of Jesus Christ. And may it inspire and encourage us as we go into this week uh, that we have entered uh, to live lives of praise and to be living sacrifices. Encourage us all, help us all, uh, help us not only in our praise but in our lives to encourage one another. It's easy to discourage and it's easy to uh, ignore and it's easy to be alone. Help us to be together in Christ. Amen.